Hi everybody, welcome to my video on how rivers record geologic forcing. In a previous video, we talked about how rivers are essentially living things, and they are able to adjust their channel morphology in response to changes in their energy balance. For example, making their channels steeper or shallower, or wider or narrower. And as they make these adjustments, they leave a topographic signature in the landscape. And if we as geomorphologists and geologists can understand how to read out the topographic signature of these river changes, we can actually start to understand why the river was changing and understand what was actually forcing the river and start to use rivers to actually give us information about the geologic past. In this video, we're going to use the Middlebury River as an example. This is a river that rises along the crest of the Green Mountains in Vermont and flows westward through the town of Ripton before it joins Otter Creek and flows through Middlebury. And we recently obtained very high resolution topographic data for the Middlebury watershed, which allows us to render this stunning hillshade image. You can see the Middlebury River coming through here. This is where the modern river is. But if you look closely at the topography, you see all kinds of interesting features. We see river terraces. We see rough bedrock surfaces. We see abandoned channels. And if we start to understand how these features form, we can read out the history of the river. So specifically in the Middlebury River, one of the interesting things is that the slope of the river changes quite a lot. It goes from being a relatively low slope river up in the Breadloaf Valley, and then it passes through the Middlebury Gorge, a deep bedrock gorge with steep walls and a very steep channel slope. And then as it flows back out onto the floor of the Champlain Valley, it goes back to being a very low gradient river again. And so essentially we can think of this as a deviation from the idealized equilibrium profile for a river. This pink line shows the actual longitudinal elevation profile of the river as it comes through Breadloaf, Middlebury Gorge, and onto the Champlain Valley floor. This is a little weird because the upper reaches tend to follow roughly what we would expect for an equilibrium profile, but the Middlebury Gorge represents this very over-steepened section, and then it goes back to almost being overly shallow and flat on the floor of the Champlain Valley. So one idea is, or one question is, if the idealized profile looks something like this black line, why do we see this deviation where the river goes steeply into Middlebury Gorge and then flat onto the Champlain floor? So what explains this gorge? And what geologic forcings is the Middlebury River recording? What's it trying to tell us? So in this video, we're going to essentially explore three of those forcing mechanisms and look at the types of topographic signatures that they might produce. So first, we'll look like at the results of varying bedrock erodibility and how that changes slope. Then we'll look at the results of changing discharge, or the amount of water in the river, and talk about how that can form river terraces. And then we'll finish by looking at the results of changing base level and talk about that how, how that can yield nick zones. So bedrock erodibility is fairly intuitive. When rivers flow over very hard rock, it's very difficult for them to erode downward. And although they might like to be lowering their slope, they essentially reach an equilibrium energy condition at a higher slope because the strength of that bedrock balances out the energy of the water. So it's hard to erode through bedrock. And we see that in the Middlebury River. Um, this is a geologic map of the Middlebury River as it flows down through Ripton. And aligned with this is a plot showing channel slope as a function of distance, OK? So what we see is the channel slope is decreasing, which it should, in an equilibrium condition. And then it actually increases right through the Middlebury Gorge interval here, OK? 
and then it goes down to being very flat on the floor of the Champlain Valley. And we see that these changes correspond very closely with bedrock strength or bedrock erodibility. Specifically, the area of higher slope corresponds to a unit of hard erosion resistant quartzite bedrock, okay? Where the equilibrium slope may be higher because that rock is so strong. Then, as the river passes onto the floor of the Champlain Valley, we flow out onto these soft sedimentary rocks that are presumably quite easy to erode, and thus the equilibrium slope there may be much shallower. So it seems the Middle Bay River does have a signal of, of the bedrock strength controlling its slope. Okay, so now let's look at how rivers record changes in discharge. So you may remember from our previous video that changes in discharge can either cause a river to aggrade or to erode. Essentially, if you put more water in a river channel, it's more powerful and it has more energy with which to erode. And I'm gonna show that river terraces can actually record evidence of when rivers switch from an equilibrium or an aggradational state into a vertical incision period. So first we need to understand a little bit about how rivers move around during an equilibrium period. And equilibrium rivers tend to meander laterally. They may accentuate their own bends in the river, causing erosion and cut banks on the outside, and then on the inside, leaving behind a flat gravelly area that essentially records where the river was in past times. And as the river migrates back and forth via these meander bends, it actually serves to flatten out the landscape across a broad area. A pretty good example of that can be seen in this LIDAR image from the Willamette River in Oregon. Here's the main river, which you can see this tributary has been meandering, and it's abandoned all these old channels as it meandered back and forth across the region, essentially flattening out this broad alluvial plain that is now fairly flat where the river meandered back and forth. So terraces start to form when the river switches from that meandering state into a state of vertical incision, okay? And that can be caused by increases in discharge or precipitation, which increase the river energy. That extra energy causes the river to switch from a state of lateral meandering to a state of vertical incision or vertical erosion. So what does that mean? It means that the river may have been meandering back and forth up at a pretty high level. And then something about the climate changed to make it wetter and cause incision. The river then cuts downward and then perhaps climate changes again, discharge drops, and the river undergoes another period of lateral meandering, okay? And then climate changes again, and we get a wet period, we get another incision period, and then yet another period of meandering. So keep in mind, these terrace treads, these flat surfaces right here, these river terraces, represent the bottom of the river as it was meandering back and forth. And these arcuate inner edges of the terraces represent cut banks that were once the edge of that meandering channel. So the net result of this process over time is a flight of river terraces. One, two, three. And then the modern river is way down here. And these terraces are essentially recording external climatic forcing of the river system. They're recording changes in precipitation that caused changes in energy, which caused the river to behave differently at different periods of time. And so it has been shown that many sets of river terraces worldwide actually correspond to known climatic forcing. So here, I've got a record of glacial interglacial cycles over the last 700,000 years. And what we can see 
is that these terraces along the Narin River in Kyrgyzstan actually correspond to these climatic shifts. So this upper terrace here is 130,000 years old. It was abandoned right as we went into the last interglacial period. Essentially what happened is as it warmed up, it got much wetter, the river became more powerful, and cut downward. Then it occupied this level for a long time, meandering back and forth, until at about 18,000 years, climate got abruptly wetter again as we came into our current interglacial and caused the river to abandon this level and incise downward to its modern level. So what's exciting is that the Middlebury River also records these types of processes, although we don't have the chronology as well understood. But what we see here, here's Highway 125 going up to the Snow Bowl, and we see some beautiful old terraces along the flanks of the Middlebury River that represent its highest level, and you can even see some abandoned channel morphology sitting right up on those terraces. And then we have some much younger terraces that reflect more recent stages of river incision. And if we look at that in terms of a longitudinal profile, what we can essentially see is here's the modern river in black, here's the uppermost original glacial outwash surfaces, so this is what the landscape looked like right as we emerged from the last glacial period. And then here's all the river terraces that have been abandoned over the last 15,000 years as the river cut downward. So essentially, what the river is telling us here is it's recording this record of post-glacial incision um, by virtue of all these abandoned terraces. So I want to finish this video by looking at how rivers can also record changes in base level. So you might recall that base level is the lowest elevation in a river system, usually a lake or an ocean. And we can drop base level in several different ways. We can change it by putting sea level up or down, for example during glacial interglacial cycles, or we can change it <clears throat> by having an active fault cut across the river essentially dropping one side of the river down relative to the other side. So regardless of how you change base level, what happens is that you give the river excess energy. You essentially create a waterfall or an over steepened area called a nick point. Okay, And right at this nick point, the river has extra slope, which means it has extra energy. It's not in equilibrium. And to try to get back to equilibrium, it reduces its slope. And as it does so, it essentially sends a wave of vertical erosion moving upstream, basically flattening that slope as it goes upstream. And when it's all done, and assuming base level hasn't changed again, the river will eventually have restored itself to an equilibrium slope where the driving forces and the resisting forces are balanced at every point along the channel. But if you see a nick point in a river, it's, it can be a good indication that the river has actually been disturbed recently, that base level may have changed recently, and that the river's still adjusting. So let's return to our, our example of the Middlebury Gorge. It looks an awful lot like a nick zone. We have an oversteepened reach, and we also have a gorge or a canyon where you can see direct evidence that the river has cut down vertically. So morphologically, it looks like Middlebury Gorge is essentially a migrating nick point where the river has cut down vertically and migrated upstream. But what could have set off this nick point? One idea is that there's an extensional fault between the Green Mountains to the east and the Champlain Valley floor to the west. If that extensional fault has dropped the Champlain Valley down, 
it would have essentially created a nick zone here and caused that incision to migrate upstream. Another option is that glacial erosion actually lowered the floor of the Champlain Valley, that glaciers carved down into these weak sedimentary rocks and essentially lowered the floor of the Champlain Valley relative to the harder rocks of the Green Mountains, and that that, that erosion created a nick zone here, which sent a wave of incision migrating upstream. So what's exciting about this is that no one knows the exact answer. We know Middlebury River is telling us something, and there's a lot more work to be done to try to figure out exactly what geologic forcings it's recording. So in summary, this video has shown that deviations of a river profile from equilibrium can reveal geologic forcings. Essentially, the river is speaking to us. Specifically, erosion-resistant bedrock can create locally steep channels. Likewise, increased precipitation can cause river incision, which lowers the channel slope and can form terraces that record that climate change. And finally, lowering base level can also create oversteepened reaches, which lead to migrating nick points and can record changes in the system. I'll leave you with these two concept questions, which hopefully you can answer after looking at the video again. Thanks a lot.